Welcome to the Spine Talk podcast. My name is Richard Geyer. Hi, I'm Scott Blumenthal. Hi, I'm Jessica Shellock. Well, cervical arthroplasty has really been a successful device. There's now 15 approved devices. Now, there's been some that have been retired because they're older. But uh, as we go down the line and see the various improvements, I think our indications have also expanded compared to the original IDE. And Scott, I'm going to ask you to first comment on that. You know, the indications, as we talked about, um, were very narrow in the FDA trials. And then a lot of us were attending these international meetings and seeing what's done outside the U.S. And at first we thought, oh, no, 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 that's not right. And then we started saying, well, maybe in more arthritic necks, which we originally thought would be not a good patient for disc replacement, it turns out that they really are. Preserving motion, even if it's a little bit of motion, and avoiding effusion has these benefits of, number one, reducing the the symptoms, number two, preserving the motion, and number three, decreasing the chance of more surgery in the future. So, you know, I, I think that's, you know, that's the thing. And a lot of surgeons will say, oh, no, you've got too much bone spurs or too much uh, collapse of the disc. And frankly, with experience, we, we found that, that that window widens. So we can do a lot more than, than, than just we originally thought. And patients, to their benefit, frankly. Yeah, and, and I think I remember when we had seen a surgeon, it might have been in Brussels, that presented a series of these horribly degenerative cases. And we looked at each other thinking, oh my God, what are they doing here? So Jess, what what do you think is the uh, no-go case for cervical spine? So we've expanded the basic indications from the FDA. And fortunately, the insurance company has been relatively good to us and allows us to still get these approved and carry them out on the patients. So what is your, your stop that you wouldn't do? Yeah, so uh, my my stop for uh, even considering cervical disc replacement would be in a patient where they have fused facet joints. So there's not, you know, um, on on a CAT scan, for example, there's not um, any actual joint, there's bone fusion across. Or in the case where there's bone that has grown completely across the front of that segment, and in order to actually get to the disc, I'd be taking down what's almost an auto fusion. Um, on that note, also, if the level is essentially auto-fused, I would not undo the fusion to, to try to restore motion at that segment. Out, outside of those as absolute um, no-goes, I agree with Scott that I think the indications have really expanded for the neck. And even in cases where there's just a couple of millimeters of disc space, which used to be thought of as you know a contraindication to restoring motion and doing an artificial disc with the you know with the skill set and the patience to really restore the the height and restore the motion intraoperatively these are patients who are honestly some of the happiest patients um, from you know a, a post-operative standpoint because you are preserving that motion you are taking away the pain and um, you're you know you're you're giving them the ability to kind of uh, realign their neck in a more anatomic way uh, with a device that continues to move. Well, let, let's talk of another change in philosophy. It used to be that if you had a failed disc, we'd go back and we'd do a fusion. Now there's a whole move to replace with another disc. And I'm going to ask Scott, who has a lot of experience with this, what do you think? So, as you alluded to, um, with hip replacements per se, there's a 5% revision rate at 10 years. We did the same study in the cervical spine, and we're like about 1% or 2% at 5 to 10 years. And when we first started seeing these, that was the thought. And what it took, frankly, was a patient to say, could you just put another artificial disc in? I had such a good result, and now you know my disc isn't working so well. And so we tried, and it worked. And now we've got a series of over 30 patients, biggest series that I know of, of disc-to-disc revisions and we're continuing to study it there are certain times when revision is not an option again you know it's patient selection not being a one-trick pony but just because you have a cervical disc that didn't work doesn't mean you have to go to a fusion 
Uh, it's something to, to, to look into. You saw a patient today, very similar circumstance. The surgeon only said, I can only fuse you. Well, you know, I think we can revise that. Now, what about insurance coverage? So we have several discs that are approved for two levels. Will they pay for a two level of any disc, or do we have to just use those two level uh, discs that have approval? Well, Rick, I think sometimes it depends on how closely the insurance company looks at what we're submitting to them, to be perfectly frank. However, there are a few that are FDA approved specifically for one and two levels, and these are two continuous levels. They have to be right next to each other. You can't have a level, skip a level, and do the next level below that and get that covered under the FDA criteria. Um, however, there are other discs out there that have not yet received approval to be used in multi-level or two-level um, settings. I think that as surgeons, we know what discs are better in certain circumstances and have the ability to decide um, which ones we want to use. But having said that, you know, m there are many times where um, the insurance company will, will flag it and uh, those might not be able to, you know, to get used in that setting, and then we go with one of the ones that's, uh, that's FDA approved. What about the patient that comes in with a previous fusion? They have now changes in a degenerative disc at the level above causing, you know, neck and arm pain, and um, the obvious thing is to consider doing a disc replacement, and how do you deal with that with the insurance company? You know, again, I just said it's it's variable. There are sometimes it just flies right on through, and you n never get asked a question. And then sometimes you have to argue with the pediatrician who has never even seen a disc replacement, who says, "No, I'm I'm your peer. I'm your peer to peer." That our policy says no. Well, every patient is different. We treat every patient individually. Unfortunately, that doesn't work in the in the corporate insurance world, which is you know a battle that we fight every day. Rick, can I add one thing to that? Sure. Just to, um, for the sake of kind of understanding some of the terminology, in that situation, what, what you're referring to is something that we call a hybrid. So uh, you can have a fusion at one level and then do a disc replacement at the next level um, adjacent to that or next to that. And, um, you know, that is something that has yet to really see its day with insurance coverage. Um, recently, the Aetna policy did actually indicate that hybrid um, would be approved. And um, so that's a, a big step, but, um, but still it's not widespread coverage with that. And so, um, you know, many times patients who have had a previous fusion from years ago and have suffered the wear and tear and breakdown of the level above because of the fusion may not be able to get coverage for the better technology now. And those are some of our happiest patients. Of course. What, what about the post-op routine? And that's changed a lot since we started doing it. Oh, my goodness. We, we have learned so much about how much more quickly we can get patients back to function. We used to put patients in these hard collars for six to eight weeks. We would wait to start physical therapy. Now you almost don't use a collar at all. You start physical therapy within days to weeks after the surgery, and by six to eight weeks, patients back, you know, riding roller coasters, playing golf and tennis, um, and, and being able to enjoy their kids and grandkids. It, it really has been a game changer. It's just amazing. And, and the patients are so grateful. Now that disc replacement has become so well accepted, the question is, what about in professional athletes? Recently, we've seen a spat of professional hockey players getting disc replacement. It used to be a no-no. Oh, you can't do a disc replacement. If they do a fusion, they can't go back. So where do you think we are with that? Well, today there was an article uh, um, naming a name who I don't remember of a Major League Baseball player just got a disc replacement. Um, we have colleagues in down under in Australia that have done disc replacements on rugby players. Um, really almost any sport it's applicable to, the most controversial of which is NFL. And we recently, a year or so ago, got uh, a meeting of some of the arthroplasty minds from around the U.S. and frankly outside the U.S. And there are criteria for fusion and return to football. And we saw no reason that the same criteria couldn't be applied to disc replacement. As far as I know, I don't think it's been done yet in an NFL player, um, but it's going to happen. 
With respect to indications for disc replacement, originally it was felt that if it, there was compression of the spinal cord or the nerve by a soft disc herniation, that would be a good indication for the disc replacement. If it was compressed by bone, the common philosophy was that no, you should not have a disc replacement. So how has that changed today? Well, I think that that is no longer um, a, a belief of the surgeons who do arthroplasty that, you know, bone spurs that are compressing against either the spinal cord or the spinal nerves, those can still be removed. And as long as you still have a platform uh, with adequate bone to uh, support the, the arthroplasty device, to support the disc replacement, then you are not compromised by, um, you know, by being able to do that surgery, you can still do that surgery. I think that there may be very few cases where, depending on the extent of the bony compression, if you really had to remove too much bone that you didn't have a stable platform or you felt that you removed enough bone that that segment was going to become unstable, then certainly you may have to make that intraoperative decision to, to perform a fusion. But I think that that is very, very unlikely in most cases when you've assessed everything with your preoperative imaging studies. Yeah, and, and the one thing I would add to that, and you mentioned this earlier, there are a number of FDA approved devices and depending on what the diagnosis is, how much bone or disc you have to take away, a surgeon needs to be able to fit the device towards the patient. So if a surgeon says, I use this device because it's the only one I use, they're not an arthroplasty surgeon. There are different circumstances under which different devices are more appropriate. And I think it's important for the public to know that. And I think just to touch on that, to explain that, a little bit more to sort of the, the layperson is that some of these devices um, have a little bit more restraint on the overall motion pattern, whereas they all continue to maintain motion at that spinal segment. Some have a little bit more um, allowance for the range of, of motion than others. And in circumstances where perhaps you do have to do a little bit more resection of some of the anatomy to, to do the surgery and take the pressure off the nerves of the spinal cord, you may choose a device that gives you a little bit more um, you know, stability, let's say, um, while still preserving motion. And, and to Scott's point, I think that's why we have many, many things to choose from in our toolbox when you have experience with these different devices. Well, what about um, some of the advancements in the newer devices? For example, the old devices were made out of metal, and now there's a newer one that we can actually get a wonderful MRI scan. Yes, the, the newer one that um, you were alluding to is the Simplify Disc. Um, and this is a disc that has a ceramic core, and, um, and it has basically the, the top and the bottom surfaces are, are a plastic that really has no um, you know, imaging uh, characteristics that are going to prevent interpretation at that level when you look at an MRI, for example. Uh, all the metal implants that are the precursors, when you get an MRI study, there is essentially a phenomenon that occurs with the metal in, in the magnet to where it's harder to see what's going on at that level if you wanted to look at that after the surgery. With this new disc and these new materials, um, you, you really will have radiologists that can see a post-operative MRI and they don't even know the patient had surgery. So I think that's one of the advancements with um, disc replacement technology is, is even in just the material science to allow us to still do this same surgery, but now um, give us the opportunity that in cases where we might really need to image that patient later on, we won't um, have any uh, you know, issues with the types of studies that we use to image them. And, and it's the best disc out there if you happen to have a patient who has mental allergies, which we seem to be seeing more and more sure. these days. Good point. Well, Scott, what about uh, the change in philosophy about the heights of the disc? Initially, with fusions, we'd stuff the disc space because we wanted that distraction. Yeah, I mean, every patient has the optimum size. And smaller people have smaller disc heights. And they actually have smaller, what we call end plates, which are the plates that go above and below the, the, the moving segment. So the more different sizes that a disc can have, we can tailor them to our patients. So that's an advantage as well. And generally when we, when we think of fusion, we're thinking of trying to 
really stretch the space open to, to try and give more room for the nerves that are exiting and kind of, you know, give the spine um, some ability to just maintain the, the height, which helps to keep the spinal canal open. When we think about doing replacements, the problem with stretching things too tight is that because it's so tight, you lose that mobility. And so, um, you know, that's, you know, to Scott's point, you know, in a smaller person, their average height of their normal discs that are, you know, functioning well are less than in some other larger person. And therefore, it's not a one size fits all. You really have to try to match up to what their, you know, natural disc height might be in order to maintain their, their biomechanics of motion. I want to thank everybody for listening to the Spine Talk podcast. And I want to thank my guests, Dr. Jessica Shellock and Dr. Scott Blumenthal. And remember one thing, if you've been told you need a fusion, make sure you come and get another opinion to see if you're a candidate for this wonderful new technology of cervical disc and lumbar disc replacement.